University. For those of you who are not from here, this is only 45 minutes away, so do visit our wonderful campus. I am also a senior scientist with IPCC Working Group 3 Technical Support Unit, the Mitigation Working Group. And thank you for coming out uh, just after a heavy, delicious lunch. Um, just to say that this session is slightly different from the previous session that we attended. We are going to zoom out a little bit. And this is going to focus on elements of a just transition. As we know, there are a lot of discussions, but we have a long way to go. And these discussions also came up in the previous session where we said there's a gap in literature on the nuances of a just transition. And as I always start this session with saying that just transition includes two heavy words, justice and transition. And they both have their own uh, complexities. And so we have a very heavy panel uh, for this session. Uh, but first, what we'll do is in the next hour, I'm going to invite presentations from the speakers, following which I will pass over to Aditi, who can then uh, who can then coordinate a panel discussion. So without taking any further time, let me invite the first speaker. Uh, first speaker is Professor James Keane. He is a professor at Imperial College London, and he's also the co-chair of working group three of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And his other hat is that he chaired the Scot Scottish Just Transition Commission. So he's got a long, uh, long-standing experience on, on dealing with just transition issues in Scotland. And today he's going to discuss the process of uh, of delivering the just transition report. So over to you, Jim. Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you very well, and I hope you can hear me too. We can hear you, Jim, and I understand that you're going to share your slides. <laughs> Yeah, I'm just about to do that now, so you should be able to to see them now, yeah? Just about. They have come in, Jim, and you have about 15 minutes. Thank you. So yeah, much. okay. Th th thanks Thanks a lot, Meenal. And just to say, although I was introduced as IPCC, I'm not going to talk about IPCC at all here. I'm just going to talk about my experiences of chairing uh, the Just Transition uh, Commission in Scotland. Now, a key thing about Just Transition is it's always very locally specific. Uh, so uh, we can only draw very broad lessons from one place to another. So just to give you a little bit of background, in Scotland, the key issues are probably around energy, agriculture and land use in respect of a just transition. Scotland stopped using coal in 2016. We have a declining offshore oil and gas production sector. And on the agriculture and land, land use side, we have a very concentrated pattern of land ownership with a lot of tenant farming, which has quite a lot of implications for, for, for just transition. And indeed, there is a big issue around land reform in Scotland, and there are legal provisions for communities to force the purchase of land from ultimate landowners if they don't manage the land sustainably, which is a, a, ve a very interesting kind, kind of process. Now, let's see if I can actually move my slides on. I can. Okay, so the Just Transition Commission I'm chairing, it was set up in, at the beginning of 2019, about four years ago, and that, this is what it was asked to do, to provide practical, realistic and affordable recommendations to support the Scottish Government, uh, looking to maximise the economic and social opportunities for uh, a net zero economy by 2045. And just to say net zero by 2045 is locked into Scottish climate change legislation to build on the existing strengths and assets, but also to understand the kind of risks that could arise from a transition to net zero in respect of equalities, poverty and uh, labour market. So a, a fa fairly clear story. Now, just to say, this was not an academic commission. It was not populated by, by professors, although there, there were a couple of them on it. It is mainly represents uh, different interests with respect to a just transition. So reflecting the origin of the just transition concept, uh, there were a couple of trade union members. Uh, we have uh, WWF Scotland for an environmental group, and then a, var a variety of different more industrial in interests. Uh, Energy Action Scotland, I should say, uh, deals with energy poverty, which is a particularly particular issue given Scotland's poor housing stock and, and the, the nature of the climate. And just to say on the agriculture side, that's uh, represented second from the bottom. 
there was an organisation called Quality Meet Scotland, uh, and th this, of course, uh, uh, re reflects the very cultural, culturally different context for looking at agriculture and land use. Uh, but they kind of represented farming, farming communities. Now, the way that we worked on this just transition, I think it's probably the process that's most relevant, uh, given the very diff different uh, context, is that we decided very early from the beginning not to run our meetings in offices in Edinburgh and Glasgow, the main cities in Scotland, but to get around the country to try and understand every meeting, we, we took evidence and listened to local people before going into a private session uh, where, where we tried to weigh up what we'd heard and develop our conclusions. So the examples, top left-hand corner, this was our very first meeting, which took place uh, at the Coalfields Regeneration Trust um, in central Scotland, very close to where old coal mines and power stations had closed down to understand the, the challenge of dealing with that. Bottom left hand corner, you can see us uh, at a set of table meetings with farmers in the uh, in the southern part of Scotland, where there's a lot of agricultural activity, trying to understand the particular issues that they were facing. And at the in the bottom and in the middle, uh, we're meeting at the oil and gas technology centre with professionals uh, from for, from uh, who are working in the oil and gas sector. And worthwhile saying that oil and gas technology centre is now renamed the Net Zero Technology Centre, reflecting the, the the spirit of the times. So a key concept is that you know we got out and and, and went around the country to understand the issues. Now. Not being academics, we didn't trouble ourselves very much about the definition of a just transition, but this is a quote that, 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 that appears in, in our very first report about the imperative of just transition. It's about designing policies to make sure the benefits of climate change action are shared and the cost don't present unfair burdens if people can't pay or if their livelihoods are, are, are at risk as the economy will inevitably shift and change. And just to say that we didn't that invent, our, invent that ourselves, it was actually one of the civil servants who support us heard it in a footnote on one of the later pages and we liked it so much that we elevated it to the front of the report and, and, and kind of have made it our, our uh, motto. Now, just to say, uh, we, you know, about three years ago, we produced an interim report from our first phase. And this was very much a thinking about what, just what just transition actually might mean in terms of scope. And so the first thing is it's not just about coal. It's not just about en the energy supply. Oil and gas obviously matters in a place like Scotland. But it could also be about the demand side as well, about what happened to people as consumers. Uh, so this is this is this is an, an extremely important part of it, an extension of the traditional concept. We really wanted to emphasise the importance of communities and the importance of place, which is why we were going around the country meeting lots of people. And as in every, every country, it's not just about future injustices that might emerge because of a net zero transition. The world is full of existing injustices, and these were recognised, and what we were really attempting to do there was to think, could we use climate action as a kind of vehicle for addressing these longer standing injustices? So, for example, the land tenure one, uh, I've mentioned already the very concentrated pattern of land ownership and one of the uh, challenges we face there one obvious way of mitigation action in the land sector is to convert agricultural land into forests. Now there comes up as an issue uh, because it may be that landowners are tempted to bring tenancies to an end in order to plant trees on previously agricultural land. Uh, and this will result on the, the tenant farmers losing not only their livelihoods, but perhaps their homes as well. And this is a partic particularly uh, tricky, tricky issue. And that's one of the reasons why Scotland has passed a Land Reform Act, which allows that compulsory purchase of, uh, of land by communities from the ultimate, ultimate landowners. 
And it is a very interesting situation because at the end of a tenancy, for example, you will find that any trees planted on the land go to the ultimate landowner, whereas any livestock belong to the tenant farmer. And just see the kind of perverse incentives that uh, that might send. Fair work is a big agenda. I mean, the nature of work is changing uh, uh, Anyway, with the you know the, the degree of uberization and and uh, casual working that's going on, so we are very concerned about the background of that for for the with the transition, and as I did mention already, the question of energy poverty. We have a lot of poorly insulated homes, a cold climate. I'm actually in London at the moment, but it's three degrees out, out, outside there at the moment, which I'm presuming is very different from Gandhi Nagar. So these are the kind of uh, issues that, that we were thinking about in, in the background. So when we produced our first report, I have to say it's almost uh, about two years ago now, we produced the final report from phase one of the commission. Uh, we had 24 recommendations, which we cynically said were to keep the Scottish government uh, uh, busy uh, 24 hours a day, but we grouped them into four themes to make them more communicable. Uh, so the first theme, was about having an orderly and managed transition. In other words, planning for the future, because our view that un was that unplanned transitions tended to be unjust by nature. So it was very important to put in place plans that would allow all social actors, whether it was government, business, citizens, NGO groups, to understand the direction in which you were going. In other words, to try and turn that into a national mission. The second theme was around equipping people with the skills and education needed to benefit uh, from the transition. And that involved building uh, things like sustainability and net zero into curricula at quite early stages, including in high schools, uh, colleges, and in universities, but also providing people with a chance to, to reskill in mid career, which might be important. Now, one example there on the skills side of it was the ability to transfer people from the offshore oil and gas industry into offshore renewables. And there were actually obstacles there. For example, if you were a diver on an oil and gas platform, you needed to pay for your own retraining to do the same job on an, on an, an offshore wind, wind farm. This was crazy. So one of the ideas we picked up is the idea of a, uh, an energy skills passport that would allow people to move their skills from one part of the energy sector with the, the minimum uh, amount of trouble. Third one was about making sure that communities uh, were properly empowered and uh, local economy strengthened. And this was very much the issue that a lot of the dynamism, dynamism and energy takes place at the local level. A lot of our specific recommendations here were very particular to Scottish context. But to give an, an, an example, one was an idea for green participatory budgeting where local authorities would actually put, have almost public meetings and much more engagement to decide how their resources would be deployed in the context of net zero. And the final and very important one, to make sure the benefits were shared widely and to worry a lot about the burden, uh, any cost and the distribution on people's ability to pay. And to give you specific examples of there, for example, again, in, in terms of housing, it's expensive to retrofit houses. What do you people prefer who don't have the ability to raise the capital resources to do that? How is it done? How, for example, is affected if you move to electric vehicles? How that applies to people living in rural areas where it's very difficult, as opposed to living in cities where building up by uh, charging infrastructure, et cetera, is, is very easy to do. Also, the upfront cost of electric vehicles, a big barrier for people on, on lower incomes. So the Scottish government reacted to all that. And one of the one of the things uh, they did was to actually create a ministerial post for just transition employment and fair work, which is in fact one of our process kind of recommendations. They introduced a just transition planning framework, a kind of structure for sectoral plans. And then under the umbrella of that framework, uh, they, they, they now ha have a, a set of just transition plans which are under development. 
and a draft plan on it has uh, just been released in the last last month. Uh, on the skills side, a lot of work, uh, a so-called climate emergency skills action plan. We don't have climate change in Scotland. We have a climate emergency just to uh, keep, keep things moving uh, and a green jobs work, workforce academy and a green jobs fund. And there is also a big fund for projects in the northeast of Scotland, uh, which is the area most affected by the decline of oil, oil and gas. So a lot of things have been done. Now, the other thing that the, just, uh, the, the, the Scottish government put in place, we deliberately, at the, the end of phase one uh, in 2021, did not recommend our own continuation. But what we did recommend was that the whole Scottish system would benefit from continuing scrutiny, independent scrutiny and advice on just transition, which was outside the Scottish government. So the Scottish government interpreted that as saying that the, the Just Transition Commission should go into a second phase to fulfil that function. And I was fortunate enough to be uh, you know, appointed as chair for, the, for that second phase as well. So what we are charged to do in the second phase of the Just Transition Commission is to provide advice on Just Transition plans as they're developed and provide annual scrutiny on, on, on the progress that the Scottish Government has been making. In fact, this is quite heavily modelled on the UK's uh, Climate Change Act and the role of its external independent committee on climate change. We need to provide advice on how to monitor and evaluate uh, the process of just transition, thinking about benchmarks and indicators that might be put in place to follow it. We are charged with continuing to engage uh, with communities in our, in our current work, in other words, following the phase one pattern. And we have indeed, indeed done that. Uh, we had a, a really good meeting out in the Outer Hebrides, which are the islands just off the north coast of Scotland. Uh, for a small country, Scotland has an incredible number of advisory bodies uh, with whom we are required to engage and co uh, collaborate. That includes the Human Rights Commission and, uh, and uh, a Fair Work Convention. And you, just to repeat it, we will be producing an annual report uh, in order to scrutinise and assess the progress the Scottish Government is making. And we, you know, we have already decided, we, we produced a, a, a report back in July. It wasn't really a first annual report because we hadn't been wing long enough, but the, the annual report, which we will produce in the middle of this year, will be structured in the following way. We will, have, uh, we will be looking at the draft just transition plans for energy, buildings and construction, transport and land use and agriculture. And I can say that we, have already had, had a somewhat sparky set of interactions with the Scottish Government on the draft energy uh, strategy and just transition plan. And quite frankly, we are well aware of the fact that the land use and agriculture just transition plan may also be one of the more contentious ones. We will have a set of cross-cutting topics around finance, for example. Scotland national, now has a national investment bank, uh, which mentions just transition in its articles of association. Be thinking about the international uh, dimensions of it. Your know, actions that taken place in Scotland may have implications else outside the boundaries. Uh, social infrastructure, uh, you know, extremely important, something that we paid a lot more attention to in this phase than the second phase. And then we have other responsibilities that we will flag up on engagement on monitoring and evaluation. Now, I, I'm doing this quite quickly, but one thing I did also want to mention as well, that in, in parallel to this Just Transition Commission, Scotland also ran a citizens' climate assembly uh, during uh, the first phase of our work. And I think this is worthwhile flagging up as an interesting process because it was really quite complementary. And the, the question that this climate, citizens' climate assembly was posed was how Scotland's should tackle the climate emergency in a fair and effective and fair way. So just transition fairness was absolutely in there. And the way this worked is that 
uh, it was 106 uh, members of the public who were going to be de uh, demographically representative uh, were selected to take place in this take part in this activity. It took place over quite a period of time, over two to three months, and they were given time and opportunity to learn about issues related to climate change and a net zero transition. They had a chance to engage with experts on particular issues, but to emphasize they were in charge of that process, not the experts. And then they deliberated, and then they produced a set of recommendations uh, for transmission to the Scottish government. And uh, the, the, the person who ran that process is now the head of the Secretariat for the Just Transition Commission, so I can lear learn lots about it. So the amount of time that people put into that was truly impressive. It, it happened during COVID, which meant they all needed to work, uh, work virtually. They were originally set up to devote six weekends to this, but uh, they, they all enjoyed the process so much, they had actually added a seventh weekend in view of their enthusiasm. And it was based around three different streams and topics. One round diet, land use, and lifestyle. One round homes and communities. This is very much the buildings. And then a third theme round, uh, round travel and, and, and work. And this covered both climate adaptation and, and mitigation. So you can see the amount of dedication and effort that went into this. There were 106 participants, but around 100 experts sort of interacted with them during the process. And they did spend you know, seven weekends on this, which is a very significant contribution from people. And worthwhile saying, people made a journey during this citizens' assembly. There were skeptics in there, and they actually changed their mind to a large degree uh, as a result of the process. So what uh, came out of it was a report of recommendations for action. There were 81 of them, so I obviously won't be able to, to go through it. There were also some parallel calls to action from a, from a children's parliament looking at youth, that, the youth contribution that uh, opted in parallel. And these recommendations were around these 15 or 16 topics on the, on the right-hand side there, which were really, really quite far-reaching. And I won't go through them, but just just to make one very strong point is that the recommendations were much, much more radical than anything than a government or even some expert groups had come up with. Once people became engaged with the issues, they were really up for taking more radical action on climate change. And you can see the range of topics uh, that, that, that were covered there. It covers, it covers the whole field. So, I, you, you know, just to say, just transition net zero is always going to be very locally specific, and we have, have to acknowledge that. But I do think maybe you know, it is worthwhile exchanging a sort of experience of differences in process as how we develop these activities. And in case you are interested, these are two, two links. One is to the Just Transition Commission, and then the other is to an evaluation report on the, um, the citizens' climate assembly process, how well it was executed and how it, it turned up. So I think these are my slides. I think, I think I'm more or less on time and I'll bring it to a close here. And you know, ha happy to exchange views on this and answer any questions that people have. Thank you so much, Jim. It's a full house here post lunch. Uh, thank you for taking us through the process in Scotland. Clearly, the discussions are quite advanced. And as the audience would also appreciate that just talking about just transition is very different from understanding the process and, and taking it to the next level. But I know you would have to leave maybe before the panel discussion. So I, I wonder if there are a couple of questions from the audience, if you could take them, Jim. Jim so hang on. There's one question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. Um, so two questions, Jim. One, uh, do you have a Scottish language phrase for the expression just transition? Uh, and second, uh, mm -hmm. in a longer uh, sense, how did you really institutionalize your recommendations? Did, did you sort of balance between creating new institutions versus having the existing institutions speak to each other more frequently? Thanks. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Two two things. There there is a, a, a Scottish language Gaelic, which appre appeared briefly, I, I think, on some of the slides at the bottom right. Just to say, I don't speak it, and many Scots do not speak it either. We uh, one of the difficulties has been there's a very thing that when you talk to ordinary people, they don't just talk, understand what just transition means or have not heard the phrase. So we tend to use words like fair and fairness as a way of characterizing it, which is something that people people uh, you know, can engage with more readily. That being said, the phrase just transition is now well embedded in what you might call, you know, kind of policy making circles, you know, think tanks, NGOs, governments, business, they all know what it, what it's about, but the phrase has not, you know, spread among on, on the, the wider population, though it might do in the future, as, you know, sustainable development did in the past. And just to say, uh, and, I mean, I think that that question is quite a good one about the institutions, because uh, Scotland has created a lot of advisory, uh, you know, sort of non-governmental body, bodies. And my personal prejudice is that we have far too many of them. And for that reason, we did not recommend the creation of lots of new bodies to deal with this. The one institutional uh, kind of innovation we suggested was having a minister for just transition within the government who could help to coordinate activities because just transition is so broad, it covers all, all different kinds of portfolios. And obviously having created a just transition commission, the government decided to continue with the effectively with the body that it's got. So pers my personal prejudice is not to have uh, endlessly multiplying institutions because it, it can slow things down and create a very complicated landscape. Making best use of the institutions you've got may well be the best way. Thank, Thank you. you. There's one more question. If there's anybody else, I can hold my question and ask him later. OK. Uh, hi, Jim. This is Aditi here. I was a bit curious about what, what kind of trainings has this green uh, green institutes that you said is a part of the plan, reskilling institutes. What, what exactly have we been doing in terms of concrete trainings and reskilling? We keep hearing about reskilling, but I'm always curious that uh, what those involve, because often renewable energy requires maybe much less labor than, uh, yeah, than coal and others. Yeah, uh, I mean, often, often the reskilling. I mean, it's not, it's not necessarily you, you, you com a complete change of direction because many skills are kind of uh, are effectively generic, but they reapply need reapplied in a different context. So, uh, you know, to to take a you know, particular example with both oil and gas and with renewable energy, there's a requirement for a lot of civil engineering kind of skills, but the context in which they're applied is different. So it may well be that the companies that re-employ people actually take on uh, responsibility uh, for for the training. But the other thing, you know, has has been, uh, you know, to reskill people in more fundamental ways. You know, for example, so far uh, to deal with uh, the question of energy poverty and the energy efficiency of buildings, it's been fairly simple measures, putting a few more centimeters of insulation into somebody's loft is pretty much what it's meaning. To get to net zero, you have to do much more radical retrofitting to 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 ho to homes to do that which means that you really need to upskill the people who are involved in that sector by quite a long way. And that means putting dedicated public money into it, building courses into you know, further education colleges uh, so that the skills are built in there, but also providing, you know, providing dedicated uh, training for people in, in mid-career. And these things are happening with you know, that green jobs workforce uh, you, you know, that, that, that I mentioned. One other thing uh, I think it, it, to, to mention, and this, this, is a, this is quite a tricky issue, uh, as you have uh, things like an offshore oil and gas regime, which is going down, uh, it, the, 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 uh, the responsibilities pass from the major multinationals, you know, the Shells, the BPs, and they're passed down the, the food chain to smaller companies with lower capitalization 
which pay less attention to training and make an increased use of, uh, of external contractualization as opposed to payroll employment. Now, this has also has implications for training because people need would then need to invest in their own training to become employed by the companies on a contract basis uh, ra rather than being being em employed on the payroll and persuading people to be able to undertake that training for themselves, to take up the opportunity for courses that may be on offer is a challenge unless they're absolutely certain that it's going to result in productive employment further down the line, which is another reason why we think it's really important to get these plans in place and make them credible so that everybody actually believes that a net zero transition is going to happen. Because unless, unless the belief is there, people aren't going to engage in this. They're not going to retrain and reskill themselves because people do have some responsibility for their own training. Thank you so much, Jin. Thank you so much for joining us. I, I understand you won't be around for the panel session, but if you are, we'll ask you more questions. Um, thank you yeah. uh, for joining, and uh, we'll, in the interest of time, move over to the next presentation. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks. Professor Joyshree Roy, who's joining us from Bangkok. Uh, she's a professor at Asian Institute of Technology, Thailand. She was a professor at Jadavpur um, University and her experience working on sectors including energy, agriculture, industry, and in, definitely in India and Bangladesh and Thailand, but I'm not sure to she you work in other contexts as well. She's also an author on IPCC Clinton Six Assessment Report and an expert on gender issues. So Joyce over to you and please, uh, I understand you will be talking about gender and inclusion in climate policy. Yeah, thank you, Minal, for inviting me. But uh, what I want is that I need to share my screen. Hope I have that uh, right to share the screen. Hold on, I need to find out my screen, right? So that's also another issue. Hold on, one minute, please. Just give me a minute. I hope you can see my screen now, right? Yeah. Joshua, you have about 15 minutes. Yeah. Um, sorry. What I'm going to do is basically focus on two things. Uh, one is um, the energy transition, and the other is about the gender and inclusion. Uh, why I have kept these two separated, you will understand as I proceed. So uh, one of the major takeaway from IPCC report is that it is not only about decarbonizing increasing need for energy supply, but there is a huge untapped potential for a mitigation which looks into demand for energy services and delivery mechanisms. And a third major takeaway, which is actually emerging from 1.5 report itself, that portfolio or combination of actions are essential for any um, action. So it's just not about renewables, but what are the portfolio of actions that we need for uh, managing the transition. So what we wanted to say is that whether it is food and nutrition sector or industry sector, transport sector or building sector, what we need to understand is that if we are talking of only supply side decarbonization, we have to really decarbonize this whole bar which is uh, the uh, gigaton of CO2 equivalent in each sector, you can see this left-hand side bar. But what we are seeing is that actually there are, on the demand side, you can change your infrastructure, you can change your technology, you can change your choices um, and preferences, and you can deliver a lot of mitigation. So you really need to focus on a smaller part of 
um, energy supply sector for decarbonization. So this is a major takeaway that we need to understand. So it's not about um, always thinking that there is a huge burden of decarbonization. We are not looking into many other aspects, which is throughout the economy, across different sectors, and uh, which is possible to be done by a large number of social actors, which is more inclusive compared to only looking at the supply side um, uh, interventions. So I'll just give one example. Uh, from our chapter in IPCC Report Working Group 3, what we could show is that suppose what people need for well-being is their nutrition, right? So if it is the nutrition which we want to provide and which is actually we derive as consumer, but we need to see that if we go upstream that, okay, for nutrition, we have food production, we have crop uh, uh, production, and then water use, then we see that there is a huge primary energy that we use, but we get very little service. So there is huge inefficiency in the, all these different layers if, if we go upstream. And there is scope for reducing um, you know, the um, overuse or wastage in all these stages, and you can make them more efficient, and nutrition service can be delivered with much lower um, uh, energy and uh, the resource need. So this is one example. So what we wrote for FAO and Niti Aayog's publication that, so basically we need to talk of the broader context when we are talking of managing the risks in agriculture and human being. And what we really need to talk of is we need three securities, food and nutrition security, livelihood security and employment security. And from that point of view, what we understood is that if we can position our needs from nutrition security point of view, nutrition security framing, then we can have a wider scope for finding solution with multiple entry points. One of those which I already showed that how you can think of upstream uh, resource use reduction and hence energy and resource use uh, efficiency if we are talking of nutrition as a service which people actually need for enhancing their well-being. So we have done a number of case studies throughout the uh, South Asian region. And from all those, our insight is that which we have written in that uh, uh, chapter is that so basically if we are looking into the market and we want to see how uncertainty rising and how do we want to manage this uncertainty and risk, then what basically we need is that we need to focus on food production distribution and delivery mechanism as a system, not only at food production, but also its distribution, as I said, the service delivery, how you deliver the nutrition service and the delivery mechanism. That means upstream going into upstream and making efficient in the whole supply chain backwards. So this is extremely important when we are talking about <laughs> these, um, uh, I mean, transitions in the energy sector uh, uh, as we are talking today. Also, what we saw is that when we are talking of institutions, then we are really need to see how we can scale up the success stories, how we can have multi-level governance mechanism, and how technology enabling institution and social acceptance can form a another sub subsystem and where we can try to optimize to deliver the transition. So what I'm saying is that when we are talking of transition, we need to look into the interconnected subsystems and the transition challenges so that we can solve them in modular form rather than thinking that it's an overwhelming task of providing just transition. So this is something which is extremely important when we are looking at the transition in different sectors and how do we provide that. So what are these subsystems? How they're linked to the overall system? 
I'm just giving you one example, you know, if we look into the Indian agriculture, what we saw is that there are different practices we, that, we, uh, that we adopt in the Indian agriculture. It may be rain fed in the drought prone areas, it may be deep water irrigation system, it may be rain fed flood prone zone where we are providing agricultural services. So there are different practices that we do. It may be that um, the irrigated single aeration, irrigated multiple aeration systems or in the upland agriculture. So every uh, uh, practice has its own energy and water need and the emissions from there. So what we can do, we can manage these also. And in, in India, they have managed it over these years. And I'm just giving a macro data, which we produced uh, with one of my students, Shreya. And where we tried to show is that basically we are showing that in Indian agriculture, we could reduce the methane emission by reducing the flooded agricultural practices. However, due to fertilizer, fertilizer use more and more, we have increased the, um, uh, the nitrogen, um, I mean, uh, emission. So nit uh, nitrous oxide emission. So basically what is important is that how these practices are being used. Now I'm saying that I, I, I don't think I have included the slide, but what we try to show is that this nitrous oxide uh, increase is so much related in India with the fertilizer pricing policy. So there are, in, that's, that's why I said there are interconnected transition that we need to look into and these subsystems we need to look into and address. So basically when we are talking of the agriculture sector, then we need to be talking about the non-CO2 and CO2 emissions and from the uh, carbon dioxide emission comes from agricultural machineries and burning of crop residues mostly. And we we have analyzed the All India data over uh, multiple decades. And what we found that very interestingly, it's the huge activity growth. As I said, the production growth, right? So that's needed with, uh, with all different uh, um, uh, need for um, uh, food security, nutrition, and uh, all these issues. The activity growth is pulling the need for uh, uh, the emission, uh, 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 pulling the need for more and more energy use and underlying figures show that basically what is happening is that we are using more, more and more of machineries in the agriculture sector, which are using more and more fossil fuel, that means oil and diesel based machineries, and also the irrigation, diesel pump based irrigation. So you will, in very interestingly, in the initial years, we saw that the energy intensity per uh, uh, agricultural yield was actually declining due to several uh, several actions taken but then in the decade of 2006 to 13 it increased a lot because of huge increase in agricultural pump set and the tractors but again we see that overall we can see that there is a reduction because of more electrification uh, and all those have led to a reduction in energy intensity. Why I'm showing this is to show that, so it is just not about the uh, fuel mix change. Fuel mix change to renewable, it's just not about that, but how you address the efficiency of the various motors and machineries which are used in the agriculture sector. So efficiency enhancement and the fuel mix both need to go hand in hand together to make the, to decarbonize the, um, uh, the Indian agriculture sector from the energy point of view. We tried to do for different Asian countries and we wanted to know during their fast growing phase, that means when they're growing at more than 7% uh, GDP growth rate, how efficient they were in terms of energy use. Singapore, China, and India actually proved to be more efficient. But if we look into Malaysia, South Asia, and Bangladesh, they are not. I, I, I have not forgot to add the data for Pakistan, which we are doing now. And we see that Pakistan is even more inefficient than Bangladesh in their energy use. So there is a huge possibility of increasing efficiency so that you reduce the burden on supply side um, efficient, uh, I mean, supply side decarbonization. 
question. And for Bangladesh, what we try to do is that basically Bangladesh has one advantage in whole of South Asia is that they are mostly gas-based economy, which is less polluting, but it doesn't uh, solve the problem because they have to move out from gas one, because it is fossil fuel over time, they have to move out. And then second, the fossil, uh, this uh, gas is uh, declining in uh, uh, supply, their domestic supply. So what they really need is this depletion issue they have to address. And they also have to see how this scaled trained national human capacity can be retained and what transition will be useful. Like what Aditi was asking Jim, that what is this reskilling? I'll come to that in one minute. And so basically we need a well-planned laid out remember that we have uh, in Bangladesh, there is a huge gas infrastructure which exists. So that becomes stranded asset if they move out from gas and uh, they do not have enough land for disaster resilient uh, wind and solar energy. So what is the transition possibility? So if you understand that what are the other energy transitions happening in the world, then you can see that this gas infrastructure can provide, actually can save 70% of the cost of energy transition of Bangladesh if they move out to geothermal and the hydrogen and for which they have huge potential. But there is very less discussion in that. So there is a dialogue that needs to happen, institution need to happen and reskilling there means that uh, for geothermal and for hydrogen, you need the same skill as the petroleum drilling sector. So they have that skill. So basically there is a, a, a easier uh, scope for making a transition. So. Challenges are so context specific and challenges are have, there are so context specific opportunities also, but there needs to be more dialogue around these. So what we are saying is that in Bangladesh, basically there is a huge potential of different uh, clean energy sources. It's just not about the solar and wind. So uh, we are working on how that can be achieved. So also what we wanted to see is that, well, if we are taking all this climate action, how gender sensitive they are, we did a huge uh, database and literature search. And we found that unless we are making sure from the very beginning, uh, project by project, the prioritization, designing and planning and implementation stage that they are gender uh, 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 at least not uh, making the gender inequality worse, if not positive even, at least to remain neutral, you really need to have more attention towards that. And just the SDG5 does not allow all the gender sensitive issues to be included. So we need a more uh, a gendered approach. And then what I just wanted to show is that India is practicing climate smart agriculture. We saw all the different practices, what they are doing. Uh, and then we saw that only in case of climate smart agriculture, it is gender, uh, it's gender negative. What it means is that the women are pushed to with the CSS, uh, um, uh, uh, I mean, entry, the uh, uh, women are pushed to more manual and low paying jobs. And so this is uh, increasing inequality more and more. So this is something, one example I wanted to cite. Also what we need to do is that uh, we are doing in climate strategy, um, uh, uh, the international think tank where I'm chatting now and where we are trying to see that what is the South to South just transition uh, happening and we are doing it in nine countries Bangladesh is one of them and we find that country teams are coming up with all different priorities from their country perspective very extremely interesting issue in Bangladesh they think that um, we met uh, two million women are engaged in uh, a ready-made garment sector and how to make that transition sustainable and just and fairness is managed is most important for them. So these are very interesting issues. And then we need to understand that international development and climate finance providers 
should incorporate these are the from nine country studies we are finding that they should incorporate just transition framing and process to ensure a more equitable distribution of finance and resources and funders can play a critical role in creating dialogue about just transitions within the countries and we need interconnected portfolio of actions technology infrastructure social cultural choices supply side and demand side we need to talk together and the gender and intersectionality needs to be built into the projects from the very beginning and just transition priorities need to find in every project uh, included so with these words i'll stop here thank you very much and they were here 10 days ago. Unfortunately, the dates changed and we couldn't have you in person, but it was as clear as having you in person. Uh, in the interest of time, we'll just take one question, but then I understand there will be time on the panel. So if there is a question in the room, happy to take it. So Joyshree, I probably then, if there isn't a hand up from the audience, maybe I can ask you a question. And this came up in a panel earlier also, that whether there is evidence of how how these worsen gender, how climate policies can worsen the gender divide. And, and you said that in the when you analyze the policies, you said that some, some policies, climate smart agriculture made women worse off. Mm -hmm. So I want to know when we do these, actually we do these studies, women don't often come to the consulting meetings and how they, what was the process that was followed and, and how, how do we get to understand these complexities? Yeah. So we, we, we got many, many case studies from across the world to show that actually whenever there are a new team coming for new consultation in the um, any area in the villages, in rural areas, peri-urban areas, um, uh, very uh, systematically, women are kept out of those meetings. Their male partners sometimes play this role to keep them out so that because they are seeing a new income generating prospect. And so it doesn't reach out to them. So it has been seen that it, 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 it is a social, historical social norm, which is there, which is creating this inequality forever. And now there is no, if there is no effort to break these historical social norms, these will uh, exasperate and then this will worsen the situation. There are multiple examples from different countries where we have shown that these are leading to negative impact. Thank you so much, Joshri. And in the interest of time, we are going to move to the next presenter, but we'll come back to you on the panel. So hang in there. Thank you. So last but not the least, we have uh, Manohara Khatka, who works with the International Water Management Institute. And Manohara has done detailed work. I believe she's sharing her insights from the Nepali case study. Yes, that's right. So we look forward to it. Can we share Manohara's uh, presentation? Yeah. Yes. So while it is open, yeah, it's very good afternoon. I think it's after long session. I'm so this tired of having good energy. But uh, on behalf of this uh, our social science team, we have done very intensive research on uh, Water energy food policy, energy policy in South Asia, Bangladesh, India, Nepal, Pakistan, using gender transfer effort. Tomorrow also we are going to share different policy cases at how different countries, like especially the policy of Bangladesh, India, or Nepal is really talking about gender, social inclusion, in energy, and water food policy, which is also linked to promote the solar radiation. So my today's uh, sharing is part of this. What I'm trying to do is that, what is the motivation of going into rigorous this kind of um, micro level analysis on gender, social and aspect of what we need to policy. With today I focus on energy and also the methodology because methodology sometimes really matter. That methodology that we are doing also can be used for other purposes. So why do we, to this research. What, to, research is about to what extent water energy food ecosystem or uh, food energy, uh, water energy 
food policy in South Asia, taking into account gender and social inclusion. This is the motivation. I come back later on. But the social inequality, as we know, all know, the gender inequality and discrimination are very much deeply entrenched in our South Asian culture, the decision making, access to resources, and opportunity. And many, many gender social scientists have already done a lot of research articulating the gender power relations at inter household, household and institution level. Uh, yeah, we follow that argument also. And access to uh, water in a school system, um, inequality is there because not only women don't know or small hearted karma don't know, but larger sector like a power based on class, gender, influence their access to technology. So our, our framework is that. So talking about the energy policy, just um, after I will share it, what look like in an energy policy sector from a gender lens, but most of the study shows that the small order karma and uh, yeah, marginal karma with the less than 0 0.5 hectare, really by uh, buying water for irrigation, also water for pumping, and most of the study on so irrigation, so energy yeah, study mm -hmm. also focus on technology, on biology of the solar technology. Not much research has been done from gender equity and gender perspective. So we hit on that. Yeah. Sorry, I am. Yeah. So our goal, while looking at the water energy, food policy or agricultural policy from policy lens. Much history on gender already argued that gender understanding is not only women under grassroots, gender cross cut at the scale, right? Household, community, and policy institutions. So uh, we argue that in our environment is the key for women is smaller trauma to access to irrigation technology like solar to benefit from them, also benefit uh, increase the income or livelihood out of the irrigation technology. So our whole uh, guiding uh, objective of this research is that better understand if energy are related to water agriculture policy in support of solar irrigation really promote gender equality or transformative change in South Asia. Our two guiding questions, how have gender equality, social inclusion been conceptualized and incorporated in the water energy food sector policy in four countries where solar project is being implemented? How have solar irrigation policies such as the policy actually and financial mechanism promote gender social inclusion principle? We use this gender transformative approach principle uh, by different color. We put there, but there are continuum from gender demand, gender lower, gender responsive, and gender transfer initiative. Our intention to understand to what extent energy policy is talking of promoting gender, not only gender line, but more to understanding systemic barrier, tackling through the measure of processes on this issue. So our whole orientation is gender towards the gender transfer approach to promote in the water energy agriculture sector, specifically solar irrigation. So to assess that, we, we reviewed the 72 in total for country policy, water energy food, and energy 31. We said that we looked at the constitution of four country and also national framework that guide the development of the country. We defined three major um, strategic element of the gender transform. We defined agency enabling or uh, recognizing capacity of women marginal trauma. They have the ability, but they don't have voice because of other issues. So we looked at agency relation and structure framework, and we defined for each this key element, we define some criteria or um, condition to how do we define agency means, and we define our total uh, criteria to assess the, this element in the policy that we review. And then we categorize each criteria for the gender blind, zero, gender over, gender responsive, and gender transformative. Yes, methodologically, as I said, we define for what does gender transformative approach mean in solar energy to the policy in the Southeast region. And then we, into, we, we define the criteria for each agency relation structure as a measure. Continuum is the key to see the which police call which continuum I'll come later on. 
So because we, we this research team consists of social scientists, policy governance, gender equity, very complex research team. We have very much critical researcher. We also did ourselves review the yeah, policy from among us and also external reviewer while um, rating our score. So besides that, to validate our rating, we also did not all policy county what for to search count the policy. After reading the policy, we just wanted to quantify the our scoring based on this whole count. Yes, this is coming to the energy policy, uh, looking at for country, most policy are gender blind, little with the understanding, basic understanding of gender, and come later on, what does gender understanding in as policy? So all are gender blind, little is the gender aware. Yeah, if we look at the Bangladesh and Nepal energy policy review, then I obtain policy of Bangladesh, state policy of uh, Nepal on energy. There is hardly mention of gender, woman, this one order type. So there is nothing on energy policy of Bangladesh. And Nepal, to some extent, there is a basic element. Yeah. Compared to Bangladesh, Nepal policy progressive. To some extent, it recognized the role of women in the energy. Basically, again, the gender is understood by women. And also, access to energy is providing solution for them to use their water. Not as if, you know, water energy also empower women, more on decision making power, income, livelihood per se, but more on easing women or growth. It's really this challenge. And then, gender, JC, in a larger match, understand only women, here and there, fewer marginalized group, and poor and remote. This is Relatively, there's mention in Nepal policy, but Bangladesh, it doesn't happen. Uh, coming to the Pakistan and India, yes, my colleague analyzed this uh, Sriya, and looking at the Pakistan, again, there is nothing, nothing mentioned on gender. Terminology wise, no, no, no even women are not recognized. You know, there is really blindness. But India, there are some, some prospective access to energy. Again, is woman workload. And also access to your know, energy technology is the woman lab, something like that. So we also looked at beside the this as 31 policy, a sectoral policy, federal level policy, all that. We looked at the two at the extent of the financing mechanism subsidy that government in poor countries are heavily promoting. Here there is also scenario that there is not much considering understanding on energy subsidy policy. Of this country, no gender equity, social equity, especially subsidy policy, financing mechanism, considering <coughs> SIP means social solar education form access by woman and teen and farmer. Subsidy mechanism, probably, as I said, promoted by government. But even if you look at the document, there is no disaggregate on who has the access to this technology by, by gender and class. Looking at beyond the sectoral policy, the effort of the agency, like was involved in solar irrigation, has been very much we acknowledge very much because they are trying through their own practice to reach out for subsidy to the women. So Nepal case at least 22 percent of the yeah 1600 SIB forms are owned by women because yeah through the information there are the SIBs given to women household or women names. Same way, 33% of SI pharma in Bangladesh is small order. No, not, not particularly women, but the least is that category is that small order beneficiary. So, however, our argument is that we need to do much impact of to what extent those people, women, marginal people who access this technology have benefited. So tomorrow my colleague is presenting with this so on ground impact assessment also. So to the to conclude our implication, yes, uh, we as I said, we also for country we review the national policy framework that guide development in the country and not constitutional. Constitutionally, national government and national development framework is really, really pro-gender, pro-equity, I would say, and also inclusive. Nepal case, for example, Edu Arena, gender social inclusion constitution, national five-year development program, same way as in India and Bangladesh. But this JC provision in the higher level policy framework are not easily translated when it goes to the sector like the inner policy. So inner sector in Southeast demonstrated that there is limited or no recognition of gender 
differential need of women and men. Men uh, across the class, a reason, or gender, other identity, it's very blind. As I said, gender is just woman. Policy gap exists. Uh, uh, point is that uh, the sector, energy sector, that is there, but it's also opportunity for us to work with the policymaker, think tank, uh, influential player, private sector, to work on gender. What does gender social inclusion mean? How to enable them to understand, also apply the gender social approach in their program and also policy. So gender integration, our argument is that essential in solar integration financing subsidy mechanism to benefit because we need targeted approach to reach out the smallholder women, including women farmer, because of out migration, women are doing agriculture. So it's a again, targeted program for on energy. So gender transformation framework will have very much detail out the process method. This could be applied for other program or sector program to understand to what action these are gender transformative or gender blind. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes. We are all running 20 minutes behind. I now have to quickly in my Jim isn't here, why don't you just take his question and be a part of the panel? And you can provide him somebody else. I think we need one more or yeah, we'll need one more. Yes. So we are running a bit behind schedule, but that's been since the first session. So I think instead of the 30 minutes that we yeah. had, uh, we will take some 20 minutes and I have uh, one question for each of the panelists. And I think Joyshree was still there, right, with us? Maybe? Yes, yes, very much. Yeah. Hi, Joyshree. So I wanted to ask you that while the just energy transition is quite accepted in the literature and this IPCC report talked about it, I mean, how commonly is it used in the Indian context? Are our policymakers talking of it? Uh, and in what context in India is this just energy transition concept being used? Basically, how, how yeah. mainstream is just energy transition in India is more of my question. Yeah. Um, I'll give example to show what is happening, right? So, okay. So basically, I would say that if you talk about just energy transition, this terminology, <clears throat> it may not be uh, 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 very common uh, at, uh, we, at every department. But I would say, I'll not name any particular department, but the other day I was talking about the coal transition or the fossil fuel transition uh, for the electricity sector. And then they were actually saying very, uh, a very pertinent uh, question. But then what happens to say, for example, Bell? What happens to Coal India Limited? And what happens to miners? What happens to those cities? They're asking very right questions. They may not be using the just transition terminology. This is extremely important. As we are doing nine, uh, nine countries in the global south to understand how just transition is understood by them, we find that basically people are looking into uh, the different sectors which are already very problematic for them, but which is also very socially relevant sector. And that's how they are addressing. As I said, for Bangladesh, they are talking about the uh, garment, ready-made garment sector, right? And in India, as I said, I was talking to the electricity sector. They really understand what happens to the upstream sector. So they do understand uh, 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 these issues. Um, and in Bangladesh, when I was just talking that, why don't you just transform your Petro Bangla to hydrogen Bangla? It was a real shock for them at the beginning, but it is sipping in now uh, gradually. So I think we need more dialogue because these have happened at the expert level, but this has not happened at the uh, implementer level. And so these dialogues are extremely important. Um, uh, I, mean, uh, I mean, as I always say that these dialogues need to happen every day so that, you know, every day understand that this is a, a routine thing that we need to do. 
Yeah. Thank you so much, Joyshree. And another, another, another point can I just add? Very interestingly, we found that, say, Colombia is actually including um, yeah, the uh, just transition from 2023, their NDC. So when right. they write, they included that because they found that uh, they are uh, they found in the coal sector in the fossil fuel sector they are in uh, losing job the another point i just forgot i should tell that all the countries of the uh, uh, i mean developing countries are saying that the informal sector what happens to the informal sector especially in the food sector food processing sector food vending sector informal sector is a huge sector and uh, the in climate impact is going to be unjust on them. So there is no policy for protecting that. Right. Right. No, that's, that's good to know that even if the exact words may not be used, the kind of discussions that are happening is, is somehow still about just energy transition. Thank you so much, uh, Joyshree. Um, our second panelist is Minal, who was uh, sharing the session. And Minal, I'm so sorry, I didn't quite have give you the time to sum up. So this is the opportunity to sum up, but also to say that so much of, you know, in India or even this time, Coronavia, all those uh, uh, discussions, a lot of the, the moment we hear mitigation in the agro food sector, there is kind of this concern that it will affect our food security, it will affect our farmers' income and all of those. So what exactly do you think is the entry point for starting discussions around food sector and mitigation, given how sensitive it is, and we heard in the previous session, this session, the dependence specifically around food security. Thanks, Guru. You've asked me two very difficult questions. I'll, I'll take it the second one first, and very quickly in the interest of time. I think our entry point should not be mitigation, but it should be development. As we always argue, and maybe Joyshree might also agree, that it is uh, because land, uh, and we show in the IPCC land report that land is governed by many stakeholders. There's far too many stakeholders who are distributed across incomes, across uh, different social uh, strata, and therefore it's not it's not a simple decision to make. I do think emissions are important, and IPCC report calls out to methane to reduce methane specifically. But I think that uh, for a country like India and for many other South Asian countries, the entry point is development. So we have to find the option that give us that improve productivity and yet bring down emissions. And that's not an easy trade-off, but I would still give food security the process. See, land is finite. So as Ulka showed us this morning that we are putting solar panels on agricultural land. So person who's working on solar will talk about solar potential on land, we'll talk about food potential on land, and then you want to talk pro biofuels on land. And there are all these trade-offs, right? And so we have to understand, and I think Manohar Raji also talked about uh, having a, not working in silos, but working across sectors. But very quickly, I wanted to summarize uh, what we did in the, what we learned in the last session. So from Jim's presentation, the process matters. So we talk about just transition, but how many of the people talking about just transition are actually going into the district, understanding the context, going and working there, bringing out data, bringing out numbers and doing the analysis. And from Popal's work, we realized that's not easy. It's just going to be very hard for us to go that deep. Uh, we still have to do it. Uh, the second thing is the intersectionality, the kind of work you also do, Aditi, that when, when we go and look at the future climate, we are going to see a lot more vulnerability to climate itself and more disasters and women who are sort of going to be pushed back because of those disasters. And then they will have the added burden of looking at the agriculture sector. So, so we, we will have to look at these issues together and that's part of our challenge. Uh, going beyond tokenism, as she rightly pointed out, that a lot of policies are gender blind. So not just having a woman as a tick box. I, I write all these proposals and journal articles and some of you may be doing it. Oh, is this gender sensitive? Yeah. Are you a South Asian woman? Yes. But actually it means much more than that. So I'll just stop here and we'll ask the question. Thank you. Thank you. No, those are those are absolutely critical points of how do you uh, kind of move towards that gender transformative. And I'll, I'll briefly come to Manoharaji after this. And I haven't introduced yet two of my panelists. One is uh, Mr. Shwetan Shah. He's with the Gujarat State Climate Change Department. 
And with Shetraji, my question is that, again, a similar question around adaptation versus mitigation. And I think what you really was meaning was kind of low emission pathway, kind of low, low emission development pathway kind yeah. of a way. Yeah. So how is the Gujarat state looking at, at this dichotomy, if you will, between mitigation and adaptation, particularly when it comes to the land sector, as to do an agriculture? Uh, so I think uh, when we talk about energy access, uh, it should be one of the priority in our adaptation. So even in our uh, adaptation communication meeting with uh, government of India, I raised that uh, India should uh, speak on first uh, energy access before uh, going for the, uh, say, clean energy or uh, uh, carbon neutral energy. Uh, that is also equally our uh, priority. But uh, at the same time, uh, first let uh, all of our citizens should have uh, basic things uh, that uh, as a government or as a policy maker we require to uh, provide. So uh, those people who are really living in uh, very uh, vulnerable areas, uh, particularly from uh, natural resource uh, dependent communities, uh, basically the uh, people in the forest, people in the coastal areas, people uh, in tribal uh, area. So almost our, uh, even 15% of Gujarat's population is from uh, tribal uh, areas where their uh, carbon uh, emission may be uh, negative, but they are not getting the benefit of uh, those things. So I think uh, Ulkaji asked the terminology what we should use for just transition in India, then uh, one uh, word uh, came to my mind was the Atmanirbhar Bharat. So, uh, uh, Urja Atmanirbharta or uh, the energy independence or the uh, things are also uh, equally important and when we will have decentralized uh, sources of those things, then uh, definitely uh, we will uh, make them more empowered and when we have India's highest number of solar rooftop of say more than 400,000 houses covered with solar rooftop. We can see that uh, uh, there an uh, light bill coming to the zero and uh, that gives them some empowerment and some positiveness towards the uh, renewable energy. And that word of mouth uh, gives a strong message in society and uh, those people will also then get uh, to the electric vehicle and uh, so on. So I think it's a circular economy and the things where uh, we really mainstream uh, the energy transition. And when uh, we will be able to do it, uh, I think uh, that will be the just uh, uh, transition. And the efforts are in those directions. We are doing the uh, direct benefit transfer. We are also bringing gender in, in the mainstream by uh, allocating the Pradhan Mantri Avas Yojana house to the uh, women member of the family. So uh, these things are not isolated or in silo, but these things are interconnected. And when we talk about the uh, agriculture uh, DBT uh, that is uh, been done by uh, government of India uh, by giving 6,000 rupees and so on, but uh, we really require to make it more rational and more uh, scientific and now we are talking about the millet year. So how uh, we can have those uh, uh, regional things uh, mainstreamed and the uh, we are also talking many times about the uh, Gujarat the parampara, the traditions of the state and how we can uh, really do it through the lifestyle for environment mission uh, at the global level. So I think uh, that will give us more uh, justice and al already our Honorable Prime Minister, when he wrote the Permanent Action Book in 2015, there is a chapter called Climate Justice. So I think this is not new to us as far as the state of Gujarat is concerned and our leadership knows it well. So, uh, so that is the point. Right. right. And, and for those of you who don't know, Gujarat actually is one of the most successful rooftop solar. And uh, tomorrow we would have uh, Mr. R.J. Wala, uh, who, uh, who is now, I think, chief engineer in the PGVC, and he will come and talk about some of those. But uh, many states in India have struggled to take up the rooftop solar, but in Gujarat, it has been really successful 
and with a lot of very good, you know, there is also direct payment to the consumers and all of that. So, this so is again, I think uh, Jim told about the local economy. So if you see in solar rooftop, we have some uh, 800 channel partners mm. uh, grown uh, to do those type of work, which were only 16 when the scheme was started in 2014 or 15. So that is the local economy, I, I believe. Yeah. True. So to Manoharaji, my question is, um, you know, you have done this today, you showed us the energy one, but I know you have done a similar work with water and food. Mm -hmm. And uh, and the food sector, agriculture sector is somehow not as gender blind as energy sector is, renewable energy particularly. Mm -hmm. So what's happening there, I mean? Yes, sir. good question. So compared to energy sector policy, the policy of agriculture and poor country are relatively better, especially very progressive or two hours of gender responsive transformative policies in Nepal, for example, same way as in Bangladesh. So they at least understand the issue around poverty and inequality in terms of food, nutrition, and land. These elements, these perspectives are there in the policy. And, and same way, compared to agriculture policy, the water policy, less transformative, two hours the awareness. No? They have at least recognize the policy in this country, water policy, includes law also, uh, recognize the uh, right to water as a basic human right, you know, right to water, right. Some, the fundamental right, right to water. And also, with looking at the 2000 uh, policy, uh, around 2000, water uh, sector policy, for example, Bangladesh, Nepal, it's really influenced by community-based approach. So most of the policy are law in water, uh, for example, are uh, understanding, a good understanding of community-based approach to water management. So at least there is community and women representation, water user association in there in a water policy, but in agriculture policy, much higher. Yeah. But my question is, since agriculture, I mean, obviously renewable policies are new, but why are we having to constantly reinvent the wheel? Because you know, yes. with agriculture, I mean, agriculture policies have been evolving now for 70 years in India, for 50 years in Nepal or whatever. So I can understand that we have long years and we have learned, but why not have these renewable energy policies been gender, at least gender aware, not gender blind right from the beginning? Yes. Do we have to again wait for 50 years? No, I think there are three or four dimensions of it. One is renewable energy and solar energy is understood as a technology fixes, right? Whole understanding of energy technologies, something had to be done with the technologies or technical people, you know, solar is a really technical matter, but sector, people, policymaker, practitioner, even researcher working in this energy sector are very weak to understand energy technology, not only technology, but it compasses all the dimensions, people-centric approach is not there. On, this is not happening. This prosperity doesn't come because the discussion around the water, uh, the energy technology. Again, what kind of agenda and science knowledge we organize? Who are there? You know, whole process of knowledge creation, discourse creation is not gender responsive or uh, not inclusive. I'd say because same knowledge is reinforced. This technological aspect of solar. Renewable energy is understood as a technology, technology. solution, not, not, as, a, not, as, not a, as, a, as a social issue, yes, not, not as, as that social, affects yes, people's yes, actual yes, lives. Yes, exactly. Yeah, so no, that's, that's very interesting. Our last but not the least panelist is Rishika Bhartika. Rishika is a journalist and she covers these issues of climate change and energy transition very well. And one of the persons I follow on Twitter, I really appreciate all her writings on these issues. She always asks the right questions. So to Rishika, my, my question is that uh, when we started the solar energy, uh, solar project, I mean, and I mean, of course, I'm familiar with the just energy transition. I was quite intrigued to see that almost agriculture sector does not really come into it, at least in India. Mostly we are talking of coal, uh, you know, that in that lens. So do you think there is a possibility of kind of, you know, expanding the net of just energy transitions in India and include agriculture and land into that discussion. Yeah, I think definitely domestically there is a lot of space for it. So internationally, what happens is again, it's the it's the same thing that comes up each time in, at international forums that if you bring agriculture into mitigation, 
what kind of burden will come on India and then will fall on people who are already in a very bad state. Uh, so internationally, I'm not very sure what direction India will take because even at COP27, India said India opposed a lot of yeah in the uh, yeah, yeah in the, program, in the joint yeah. work group yeah yeah. yeah. Uh, so I don't know, I don't know internationally what we are planning to do and because India has not made any formal submission on Corona so it was just statements that are being made. But I guess it still comes from a lot of justified skepticism maybe. But domestically, what I see is so recently I did a report on coal transition in India. Many mines are already closing down and many power plants are already closing down. So you cannot say I'll start in 2050 or 2070. It's, it's already bad now. So I could see parallels with agriculture also. Farmers are already in a bad state. So if you can help them with replacing diesel with solar, if their costs come down, then why not? So you don't have it, you don't have to have a mitigation focused angle for it. So if if Ulka just today morning she was saying it's just one percent. So diesel, the amount of energy used for diesel is just one percent of India's emissions. So it's not, it's maybe a little bit of a silly topic to put under mitigation. But if it, we can actually help farmers come out of maybe a little bit of their financial stress, if you replace, then why not? Right. It's coming back to that development angle, low yeah. emissions development. And actually, even from the government point of view, if the if the government thinks it's cheaper to give solar, decentralized solar, than extend grid, mm. then again, why not? Right. So it's just the lens that we use has not necessarily got to be the mitigation yeah. lens. I think that's a, that's a very good uh, kind of take away from this. And we are behind schedule. I think we will break in another three minutes. But if there's anybody with any further questions, do you have a question? Please yes, go ahead. Thanks to the speakers. I'm um, Evan from South Africa. Um, you know, I want to ask this because, you know, South Africa with energy you know, sitting in a crisis with load shedding. But recently, um, our president has announced the lifting of um, other regulatory frameworks that were impeding on the uptake of you know, solar energy, like environmental regulation. I just want to know in terms of your regulatory frameworks, how does it look like? Are there any bottlenecks that are actually hindering the implementation of these um, solar energy initiatives? Uh, so energy is always a subject of as an energy basket. So we cannot have, uh, say, dependence on one source and uh, definitely, uh, we require a base load. So India is scattered by base load from coal now. Some Western countries have base load from nuclear energy. So it depends on what resources you have. Uh, in some part, it is also the hydro. So uh, different countries have a huge dependence on those uh, resources. And uh, solar and wind are uh, the resources which are not in anybody's control. So it has uh, its own uh, limitation itself. And now, therefore, we are talking about uh, energy storage uh, in terms of pump energy storage or uh, maybe uh, the battery energy storage and green hydrogen. So uh, it is a very uh, a, uh, in infrastructure and uh, technical subject as uh, the madam said uh, and it will be so uh, we cannot have uh, those things so now smart grid and uh, some artificial intelligence in uh, our demand supply forecast uh, will help us uh, so uh, these things has to be uh, in agenda and i think uh, then comes the uh, just transition, which will uh, add on uh, social value and environmental value to this entire uh, technology game. So uh, all these things are required. At the same time, we also require some of the clauses of Paris Agreement to be, uh, say, followed. And we hardly discuss those things. And I think we should flag it uh, always uh, of technology transfer and uh, intellectual property rights so that we can have, uh, say, uh, equal distribution of uh, those uh, knowledge stream across emerging economies. Uh, and I think BRICS uh, is one of the very important. And this year, we are uh, also hosting the G20 in, in India. And uh, I think climate change is there uh, as a discussion in all the uh, Sherpa tracks, whether it is Business 20 or Urban 20 or Startup 20 or 
uh, uh, women and youth 20. So I think uh, we require to make people aware about all these things and how we can contribute. And now you see that uh, in Brazil, they have a very good uh, ethanol blending in their uh, uh, liquid fuel. Similarly, India is uh, taking uh, that thing uh, in consideration and uh, we are also uh, hoping high for 10% uh, that we already achieved and 20% by next year. So I think these are the very, very a bright example of uh, make uh, of uh, say uh, dovetailing all the resources and uh, mainstreaming decarbonization uh, across the sector and i think uh, we will have more and more dependence on uh, electric energy and we'll shift from thermal energy to electric energy when we are talking about net zero so i think uh, that we require to teach uh, our engineers, our all uh, students, and I think uh, education, Jim very rightly said, is one of the very key part for the just transition so that uh, policymakers and uh, like you very rightly asked about uh, the details of uh, this energy basket. So those basic understanding and knowledge will really uh, help all, for all of us to push decarbonization. Thank you so much. Yes. Yes, just I, I think we are just completely beyond the time. Keep it brief and ask who you're asking to. Yes. Uh, Manora, this goes to Manora. Thank you yes. uh, once again. Nice study. Uh, I was just wondering see, some, some things what we do when we you know, try to analyze policies, programs, schemes. I'm assuming you have done all this. You know, we tend to also go by these uh, you know, impressions that if it is written beneficiary, it means only men. If it is written farmer, it means only men. So, you know, but but suppose if you do some wide stakeholder consultations to try to get these people on board who have uh, prepared those policies and get those clarifications with them. You know, when you say beneficiary, whom do you mean these beneficiaries are? Yes. So maybe, you know, the, the gender lens, you know, the way we want to analyze the policy will also be. So I mean, it's, it's, it's a kind of a query that uh, whether you, you know, also did some kind of these consultations and also uh, a kind of a suggestion that maybe, you know, we also need to broaden the way we, you know, look at these policies and uh, then make it maybe gender neutral first, because if in our mind we go by that impression, then we end up, you know, maybe coming out with the analysis, which I don't know, might not be, uh, you know, in, in the context. Yeah. So our main intention is that, uh, Policy legislation already there to attack in this policy is really was well guided or framed using the gender lens or I mean, equity lens. So we focus on analysis, the content analysis the method. But you are right, during the policy making process, another study could be how this policy was made. Yeah? Who steered the idea? Who brought the idea? Even if, like, a agriculture policy is very Consider is gender issues and very much uh, equitable oriented, equity oriented. But how this idea and this the solution or measure in the policy was possible? We need this kind of assessment also. But process wise, yes, definitely any process or any policy of sector, water, energy, food, or agricultural sector should be, as you are saying, it should be really multi stakeholder discussion, also bringing social scientists, technical scientists, not only scientists, practitioners to understand common issue around the water or agriculture or energy and discuss whether this issue is related to how the issue is really linking, woman, what are the women issues, small order farmer issue, issue based discussion should be there and solution would also come definitely through the discussion. But here the, we have not done analyze the other energy we, policy we have yeah, made. We have made, yeah. yeah. So we, we have not gone back to yeah. the policy makers and then yes. asked that did you mean only men farmer by farmers? But I think your words matter. Yeah. matter yeah. Because yeah. we know that because uh, because of the you know long-standing structural barriers, we know the moment we say farmers for majority a man comes to mind. Mm -hmm. You know, so unless it's written men and women farmers, it's very difficult to get those included. So I think the main point is that your words matter. I mean, we of course know that policy has its own implementation process and all of those. So but that was so. With that, uh, sorry we ran a bit out of time, but uh, that's that's when happens when we have a packed schedule and very interesting talks and people. But thank you so much. Uh, we will now break for tea, maybe around 10-15 minutes, and 
then we all go back to the plenary where we would hear from all the sessions that we couldn't go, what happened in those sessions. So, <laughs> thank you so much, Meenan, for sharing and